Hello, and welcome to a brand new playlist. So in this playlist, we'll be going over Calculus 2 as a course. So what is Calculus 2 and how is this different from Calculus 1? Okay, so let's talk about what Calculus 2 is. Generally, in most universities and most college courses taught, and even some high schools, Calculus 2 is simply an extension of what you learn in Calculus 1. In that, in Calculus 1, you talked about the rates of change in derivatives, limits, and you touched a little bit of integrals. In Calculus 2, we take the idea of an integral and extend it a little bit beyond what we learned previously in Calculus 1. So in Calculus 2, for instance, we take the idea of an integral and extend it to applications of integration, for example. We talk about the area between curves as kind of the first topic in standard Calculus 2 classes. We also, we also talk about solids of revolution. So you might, you might be wondering what that is. Well, the area between curves is, for example, is saying, well, if I have the area of under a curve, which you learn in Calculus 1, what happens when I have two curves? How do I find the area of just this section, for example? Or what if I want just this section? How do I do that? So that's kind of the first sort of idea of Calculus 2. Now the second part of Calculus 2, the of the applications of integration part, is the solids of revolution. So this one kind of talks about volume in the context of integrals. So for example, if I have some kind of a, some kind of a curve, like so, and I kind of rotate this about the axis, what's that solid gonna look like? Because for example, if you just kind of try to imagine for a second. If I rotate this kind of line, it's going to look like a kind of like a solid figure of sorts. How, how do we calculate the volume of this thing? And in general, how do, you use, how do you use integration to calculate the volume of an object? So that's kind of the first part of Calculus 2. The second part of Calculus 2 is talking about the idea of techniques of integration. In Calculus 1, you learn about U substitution and a few other small kinds of manipulation. But in Calculus 2, you learn about many different kinds of integration techniques. The first one which you learn is integration by parts. The second one you learn is partial fractions, trigonometric substitution, and many other things. And that kind of takes care of the initial part of Calculus 2. The second part of the course is going to be talking about infinite sums and the notion of convergence and divergence, which is very, very applicable in many fields in mathematics and beyond, such as engineering and many other fields in many different kind of disciplines. <laughs> so now in this situation, we actually talked a little bit about sums in Calculus 1, but we kind of only talked about finite sums. We didn't really go to infinite sums. For example, in previous, in Calculus 1, for example, we talked about what happens when a sum from i equals 1 to 5, for example. We did talk about infinite sums in the context of Riemann sums, but that's not really the same thing here. In this situation, what happens when I have an infinite number of terms? So as a kind of a direct application of this, so suppose I have the summation from i equals 1 to infinity of some term. How do I kind of know if this converges or divergence in some way. So that's where we talk about things like convergence and divergence. We use some tests to figure out like how sums will converge and diverge and a few other things. So this got the motivation behind the idea of infinite sums. Then we also talk about applications of how to use infinite sums in the sense that, okay, well, I know how to figure out something converges or diverges. Can I use it to get any kind of information about um, representation of functions as a sum? Because previously, remember, we talked about the concept of a Taylor polynomial, which was essentially just an infinite sum of partial, oh, it was just an infinite sum of derivatives, which is just added up. So fn of x over n factorial. This was essentially what a Taylor polynomial was, but the idea is that, okay, what if I, other, other applications beyond Taylor polynomials, can we use some other things? And yeah, it turns out you can. You could use something called power series to represent functions as summations instead. And that's very powerful because you could use it to kind of do integrations that would otherwise, otherwise normally be impossible. You can use series to do integrations such as this, for example. 
if you try to use standard techniques to integrate this, this would nor normally be impossible. But if you use series to do this, which you'll see much later, this, this is going to be possible to do. The next thing we talk about are other coordinate systems, because Cartesian coordinates, the xy axis, that's fine. Like, I mean, yeah, that's that's all fine and good. But this isn't always necessarily the best way to kind of think about functions with different kind of coordinate systems. Like, for example, if I have the equation of a circle, or an ellipse, describing this ellipse using the xy plane is doable, but it's kind of hard to do it. And for example, if I have to, if I have the equation of a cone of some kind, I can use I can describe it using guess why so using Cartesian coordinates. That's fine, but it's not always that easy. So is there a way to kind of choose other kinds of co other coordinate systems so that it's easier to kind of kind of representation? It turns out there is. Yes, you you can do that. It's just a matter of figuring which one to choose. So we can use something called polar coordinates. We can use something called cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates and so on, which is something we will talk about a little bit later. And the last part of this thing is vector calculus. And as you can probably tell by the name, this is involved with doing calculus in with vectors, but go, go figure. <laughs> so there's something too special about the last chapter, but it's it just slight kind of touch on vector calculus. It's not gonna go too in depth just because this branches off to other kind of branches of mathematics, such as core and geometry and many and differential geometry and many other things. So we it's best we don't talk too much into about that, but we will cover some vector calculus. So as you can probably see from red texture, there's gonna be about 60 videos. This is a this is a tentative schedule, but I mean it should be about 60 videos. They could it could be a little bit higher or lower, but I'll try to keep the same kind of pacing. And of course, I'll be attempting to do an exam review for a standard Calculus 2 exam as well for this class. And that will be that. So what makes Calculus 2 different than Calculus 1? In Calculus 1, you're given a bunch of formulas. In Calculus 2, you're given more general kind of formulas. What does that mean? What I mean to say here is that in Calculus 1 example, you learned something called the chain rule. The chain rule was, if you knew the chain rule, you could apply it to almost any situation. Like, it was pretty straightforward in that sense. Like, if you were given a function, you could use the chain rule to find a derivative. And it always worked. But in Calculus 2, this isn't necessarily the case. In Calculus 2, for example, one of the first things you learn is the formula for integration by parts. So I'm just going to write integration by parts, IVP for short. But the problem with that is that using integration parts is not always straightforward. Sometimes you have to recognize that integration by parts can even be done. And that's not always really straightforward. Sometimes you have to look at the integral and go, oh, can I can I use this technique? Can I sometimes use this technique? Can I not use this technique? What methods can I use? Can I can I try a different technique? And that's always that's almost often gonna be the question with most of the topics in calculus too. The other thing that's gonna be a quite new is solids of revolution because you're generally given two or three different kind of formulas to solve a solid revolution but again it's not always going to be it's not always going to be obvious which one to use sometimes it might not be clear as to which kind of solid you have sometimes you don't know what the bounds of the integral are sometimes you don't know how you approach different kinds of solids sometimes as you'll see we'll talk about something called cross sections it might it might not be clear which cross sections to use so i'm saying my my the takeaway here is that in calculus 2 the formulas you learn in the, in this class won't necessarily apply to every single situation sometimes you'll have to go to the the question and really think about oh what can i do here can i do this can i try that okay does that work does that not work essentially you're given a bunch of tools and then you have to see which tool kind of works and that's essentially the what makes calculus 2 a little bit harder than calculus 1 but you'll see with a bit of practice and intuition, it's still not too bad. It just takes a bit of getting used to. Okay, so with that, I um, that covers basically the introduction video. In the next video, I'll be starting the first topic in Calculus 1, with, or Calculus 2 rather, which will be the area between curves. I'll be doing an introduction to that video and several examples, and we'll go from there.
I'm very excited to start this series and I will see you all then. Have a great day.